In Yaroslavl, right social revolutionaries under the leadership of Boris Savinkov rebelled on July the 3rd. Savinkov had been an infamous terrorist. Savinkov's forces were only defeated with barrages of heavy artillery. On July 22nd, the city lay in ruins. The red victory over Savinkov's forces coincided with the defeat of the left socialist revolutionary rebellion in Moscow. The left SR rebellion began in July during the 5th Congress of Soviets held in Moscow. A majority of the delegates had approved a policy of maintaining peace with Germany at any cost. The left SRs opposed making peace with Germany and attempted to force a break in the Brest-Litovsk Treaty by assassinating the German ambassador Count Leopoldus Mürbach on July the 5th. The next day, the left SRs, led by Maria Spiridonova, began an uprising in Moscow. They arrested Felix Zezinsky and 30 other Bolsheviks. The rebels seized the central telegraph office, but could not take the Kremlin. On July the 7th, after bitter street fighting, units of the Latvian riflemen stormed the left SR headquarters in Moscow. Over 300 people were taken prisoner, 13 were later shot. This rebellion in Moscow was the aftermath of a bitter power struggle between the Bolsheviks and their left social revolutionary and Menshevik opponents. The Bolsheviks became determined to destroy all opposition to their revolutionary program. In December 1917, an organization called the All-Russia Extraordinary Commission, headed by Dzerzhinsky, was formed to fight opposition to Bolshevik control. During the next decade, it became an instrument of political suppression and a system of terror. It is symbolic that the Bolsheviks put up a statue of Robespierre, who had said, the basis of a democratic government is virtue. The means for implementing it is terror. Dzerzhinsky's organization, the Chika, launched an attack against the old order, and all the people and institutions that sought to preserve it were marked for destruction. The victims of the Chika's terror were selected not so much on the basis of crimes perpetrated against the new government, but on the basis of the threat they represented to the new objectives. In the months after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks' political opponents used terrorist tactics reminiscent of the last decades of Tsarist Russia. In June 1918, the Bolshevik Commissar for Press and Propaganda was murdered. Then, on August the 17th, the head of the Petrograd Cheka was killed by a social revolutionary assassin. The Bolsheviks unleashed a campaign of terror against their opponents. The Red Terror became more intense after Fanny Kaplan, a member of the social revolutionaries, attempted to assassinate Lenin as he addressed the workers at a Petrograd factory. Bolshevik vengeance became more organized and the power of the Cheka was unlimited. Red terror provoked not only the white opposition, but foreign troops and guerrilla partisans, who retaliated by unleashing a terror of their own. Violent death became commonplace. After his abdication and arrest, Nicholas II, his wife Alexandra, their son Alexei and their four daughters had been sent to Ekaterinburg, where they had been kept under guard. In July, the Bolsheviks feared that approaching white troops might free the former Tsar. On the night of the 17th, local Cheka men executed the royal family. By the summer of 1918, 
red forces had yielded large territories and Bolshevik Russia was no larger than the ancient Muscovite state. In the east, enemies of the Bolsheviks seized the cities all the way to Kazan. Earlier, an anti-Bolshevik government known as Komuch had been formed in the city of Samara. Now, Komuch troops and forces of the Czech Legion entered the city of Kazan, unopposed. The Serbian battalion that defended Kazan's Kremlin fortress had betrayed the Bolsheviks, and the Red Flotilla withdrew up the Volga without offering any resistance. During World War I, when the Germans threatened Petrograd, the gold reserves of the provisional government had been sent to Kazan. The Whites seized the gold when they captured the city. The white presence in Kazan posed a far greater threat to the Bolsheviks than the loss of the gold reserves. From Kazan, there was a direct road to Moscow, and the Bolsheviks feared an attack on the capital. The Eastern Front was now critical, and Lev Trotsky arrived near Kazan. Trotsky was second only to Lenin in the Bolshevik leadership. Like Lenin, he firmly believed in the rightness of communist dogma and he implanted this belief among the masses through his unequalled oratory. More than anyone else, Trotsky shaped and influenced the Red Army. An arch enemy of Stalin, Trotsky was doomed to disappear from official Soviet history. In the West, he would often be viewed as the antithesis of Stalin and many would forget that Trotsky created many of the concepts that would become pillars of Stalin socialism. To the Kazan front, Trotsky brought not only ammunition, but military discipline. He ordered deserters executed, then regrouped the Red Forces. He singled out the best soldiers and appointed new commanders. Joachim Vatsetis, the commander of the Latvian riflemen, was placed in command of the Eastern Front. He, as well as 75,000 other Red Army officers, had served in the Tsarist army. As the empire collapsed, the Germans advanced, and their own troops disintegrated, they saw their primary objective as defending Russia. Trotsky believed his young army needed the knowledge and experience of these specialists. He was also aware that victory would require higher morale among the troops and a reimposition of the discipline that the Bolsheviks themselves had undermined before the revolution. But although Trotsky gave command authority to these former Tsarist officers, he appointed a Bolshevik commissar to supervise each one. Because Red military losses were immense, Lenin and Trotsky launched an active campaign at the rear to recruit and train new units. Five million people would eventually be trained in paramilitary organizations for the new Red Army. Near Kazan, in a combined operation, the forces of the newly formed Red Army won its first major victory. On September the 10th, the 5th Red Army and the ships of the Volga flotilla, supported by mine carriers from the Baltic fleet, took the city of Kazan. Trotsky referred to this victory as the event that taught the Red Army to fight. Two days after the Red Army consolidated a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Volga, Simbirsk fell, thus opening the way to Samara, 
the capital of the anti-Bolshevik Komuch government. The Komuch escaped to Ufa, several hundred kilometers to the east, but by November, the Red Army had reached the city. The capture of Samara, a city in the largest grain-producing region, temporarily eased the Reds' food shortages. But hunger in urban areas continued, as Russia's peasants refused to surrender their grain supplies to the Bolsheviks. In May 1918, a system of compulsory requisitioning was introduced. The Bolsheviks organized food units. By the end of 1919, 70,000 men formed a food requisitioning army. Their work was simple robbery they caused starvation and death. Resistance was mercilessly crushed. One of the men appointed to head the food requisitioning units was Josef Stalin, who was sent to the Volga region in June 1918. Within a month, he had become chairman of the Military Revolutionary Committee on the Southern Front. Stalin's first combat command was at the Battle of Tsaritsyn, but he was not the architect of the strategy that saved the city from Cossack troops. Later, the minor role he played in the red victories of the Civil War would be greatly exaggerated. Krasnov's Cossack army hoped to secure their stronghold on the Don by driving the Reds from Tsaritsyn, the strategic center closest to the Don area. From September 1918 to January 1919, Krasnov's forces encircled Tsaritsyn three times, but failed to take the city. After the bloody and exhausting battle, Tsaritsyn became known as the Red Verdun. Tsaritsyn cost the Reds dearly. In the autumn of 1918, 60,000 Red soldiers perished defending the city. The high casualties largely resulted from the incompetence of Stalin and Varashilov, who overrode the command decisions of former Tsarist officers. Months later, at the 8th Congress of the Bolshevik Party in March 1919, Trotsky attacked Stalin, Varashilov and their associates. Lenin supported Trotsky's charge that ignoring experienced commanders and using guerrilla tactics caused the enormous red losses at Tsaritsyn. A majority in the Congress agreed with Lenin that the Red Army could not exist without iron discipline. Stalin never forgot his defeat or forgave Trotsky. The Red Army began its transformation into a powerful and well-organized fighting force. In the summer and autumn of 1918, the Red Army had to face not only Krasnov's Cossacks, but also Denikin's volunteer army. Denikin had finally received Allied aid. With fresh stores of material and ammunition and troop reinforcements, Denikin launched an offensive to Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban, which the volunteer army had failed to take the previous spring. Denikin captured key railway stations and cut off the Taman Red Army located to the west. These 30,000 soldiers managed to join the major force of the Red Army, but could not save it from defeat. On August the 16th, Denikin's forces entered the capital of the Kuban. Soon they had taken the second largest city in the Kuban. By late autumn, the bulk of the Red Force had been driven to the edge of the desert-like sandy steppe, which would become a mass grave. The Whites paid dearly for their victory. Thirty-year-old General Markov, one of Denikin's closest associates, died of wounds. He had commanded the 1st Officer Regiment and an infantry division, both of which bore his name after his death. 